Our next uh, presenter is uh, Sander van der Burg, who has been a long, long time contributor to Nix. Uh, he's definitely been around for, I don't know, seven years, eight years maybe. Eight years, actually. <clears throat> and before the talk, I uh, sat down with him and thought about, okay, what are the things that you contributed to Nix and that we should mention? And it quickly became apparent that it would be silly to try and mention all of it. It's just uh, too much. There is, uh, I think... The uh, Android environment, development environment, for instance, is uh, one of his contributions, and there are numerous others. Pun? Oh, sorry. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> <Very>. <laughs> <laughs> and today uh, he'll tell us about uh, this Nix system, which has also been around for a long time, really. And uh, I hear it's even going to include a live demonstration, so let's keep our fingers crossed. Okay, have fun. <laughs> okay, can you hear me now? Okay, so this talk will be about, uh, be about deploying microservices with Disnix, and in this talk I actually try to cover both aspects, and I hope uh, you guys feel excited by it. So, recently I discovered this article saying why 2015 will be the year of microservices, so in less than two months 2015 will be over, so then we can reflect on how well uh, microservices have conquered the world. There are even books uh, available at micro, uh, about microservices. I must admit, I haven't read them, so don't ask me about them, but uh, they might be useful. But microservice architectures, what are they? So this is some definition I found online on Martin Fowler's website, and he, um, I must admit this is quite a, quite a long explanation but it has some interesting keywords inside it. For example, we have processes that commun communicate with uh, lightweight mechanisms. They typically use HTTP. Um, these services are built around uh, business capabilities. They're, they're independently deployable uh, by fully automated deployment solutions. Um, we can use many different programming languages and data storage technologies to implement, to implement them, and that's all great. However, eight years ago, uh, I was doing uh, research, and uh, this is a paper I read about service-oriented computing and service-oriented architectures. And if you read the description there, you find something like this. Services are autonomous, platform-independent, they can be loosely coupled. They also seem to be built around business processes. Um, they uh, also support uh, network availability and things like that. So I think this definition has quite a, an overlap with microservices. And 10 years before this paper was written, there was also this book about component software. Uh, and yeah, basically uh, this book states that uh, a, uh, a component is a unit of composition. Uh, it has contractually specified interfaces uh, and context, uh, explicit context dependencies only. And of course, components can be deployed independently and they're subject to composition by third parties. So, in my opinion, microservices aren't really a new revolution, but there's something good in it, and that is dividing, apparently dividing your big monolithic software system into components, that actually is beneficial. And also to make these components network uh, transparent, that's also a nice addition. So, uh, when I discover something new, I always try to implement some kind of example to figure out what... Uh, in what way it could benefit me. So I've decided to implement an example system to see how well uh, microservices uh, could benefit me. But my brain is a bit empty, so I couldn't think of uh, a good example. So I've decided to implement something stupid, which I call a staff tracker. And that's basically a software system that I can use to uh, maintain a collection of staff members. I can uh, maintain the, the, their room numbers. And I can use these room numbers, for example, determine what their zip code is. And I can use the zip code, for example, to determine in what street and city they are. So that's uh, a nice way to uh, violate the privacies, I think. And also, uh, because I want to discover how well uh, microservices work, I've decided to divide this system into processes communicating through lightweight uh, network protocols. 
So I ended up designing an architecture like this. So basically what I need is I need to maintain three collections of data. I need to maintain rooms, I need to maintain staff members, and I need to maintain zip codes. So I've decided to implement a microservice with an HTTP interface that provides uh, read, update, delete, and create access to these records. Also, I've decided to develop a, a, a web application front end. I've also decided to separate that into a separate process that's isolated from the web services uh, that work with the data. Also, I've decided to uh, divide the data over three databases instead of storing it into one single database. And also, I'm using an Nginx proxy in front of the web application because I find it more reliable and more, uh, more efficient. So, there are actually some pros in designing a system like that. And uh, on Martin Fowler's website, I found three interesting uh, criteria that he described. Like, if you de uh, design a system like that, you have strong module boundaries. So that means I can, for example, uh, build development teams around each service. Somebody can implement the web application, some other team can implement the, the service providing me access to the staff members, and so on. Also, um, by having an architecture like this, I, can do, I support independent deployment. So for example, if the web application blows up for whatever reason, the service that provides access to the data record, for example, shouldn't crash. It's a separate process. And also, if you support independent deployment, then that also typically means we have fewer dependencies. So typically, these modules are much easier to deploy. And also in an architecture like this, we have something called technology diversity. So uh, it doesn't really matter what technology I use to implement it. I can use JavaScript to implement one microservice and I can use Python for another, uh, for another service. I can choose whatever database I want as long as I just communicate through HTTP. It doesn't really matter. There are also some cons in designing an architecture like this. Um, I also took these cons from Martin Fowler's website and one con is uh, distribution. So uh, there's always a network link involved uh, for communication between components. And these network links could be quite slow and also subject to failure. So that means if something fails, also your uh, system as a whole might fail for whatever reason. Also, eventual consistency is a problem. So uh, I've decided to separate the data into three separate databases, but these databases are related to each other in some way. And that means, how can I ensure that these relations uh, remain consistent? That's quite difficult. But I think probably the biggest con is operational complexity. And that means, for example, if we deploy a, a system like this, that consists of eight components, we might want to deploy all these eight components to one machine, but we could also deploy them to individual machines for performance reasons. That means, in worst case, I need to maintain eight machines. Also, I can choose any technology I want, but if I would choose many technologies, that also means there are many ways to build my services from source code. And also, uh, if I would use multiple operating systems, then also my deployment procedure would be affected by it. So that turns a uh, deployment process typically into a nightmare. And also, there are matter, many other things uh, that we have take, to take care of. For example, if we upgrade the system, uh, how can we do it frequently? How can we ensure that we don't break anything? How can we ensure that, for example, that if we upgrade, that the downtime is, is minimized? And also, if we regret uh, doing a particular upgrade, we might also want to roll back to an old configuration. So these are all uh, issues you have to cope with uh, in maintaining and upgrading uh, a microservice or, uh, architecture. But luckily, there's the Nix project uh, providing us uh, interesting deployment tools. And basically what we do in the Nix project, but that's something you probably already know, is we support automated deployment using declarative specifications. And um, besides uh, having an automated deployment solution, we also in the Nix project support uh, a number of interesting properties, like uh, Nix tools are generic. They're not bound to any programming language or component technology. We can use it for any language, Java, Haskell, Node.js, Python, and so on. Doesn't really matter. 
Also, uh, tools in the Nix project uh, support reproducible deployment. That's also a nice feature. I, deploy, I produce a configuration on my machine. I can easily uh, uh, reproduce the exact same configuration on a different machine if the inputs remain the same. Also, uh, tools in the Nix projects have strong uh, reli reliability guarantees, like dependency completeness, atomic upgrades and rollbacks. And also, they're quite in efficient in the sense that uh, Nix tools try to only execute uh, deployment activities that are required to do to get the system running. It, and of course, these tools, you already know them, uh, they're all driven by declarative specifications. And uh, if you run the tools, the tool figures out what activities need to be carried out to get the deployment working. So for example, if you write a NixOS uh, specification, it figures out, hey, I have to build uh, a number of packages. Uh, I probably have to transfer some packages from one machine to another. And also, I probably need to activate uh, certain services in order to make the, the system working. You, as an end user, don't have to worry about that. You just write what you want, and the tools deliver uh, what's described in the model. And if you want to do an upgrade, you basically adapt the model and run the tool again, and it figures out what the corresponding update uh, activities are. So, if we deploy this microservice architecture that I just designed, how can we deploy uh, such a system the Nix way? And that's actually something... Uh, that's actually where Disnix comes in handy. So Disnix is specifically designed for such a purpose. So in Disnix, um, you basically write three kinds of models. Um, the first model is the services model that basically describes of what components my system uh, consists and what their dependencies are and how to build them from source code. The other model is the infrastructure model. So we have to deploy to remote machines in the network. So we must know which machines are available and what the properties are. And there is the distribution model, which you can use to map services to machines. So you can basically say, hey, I want service A to go to machine one, and I want service B to go to machine two. And then, yeah, basically just running one single uh, command line instruction suffices to get all the deployment uh, activities executed. So, um, we have to write these declarative specifications in order to deploy something, and that's actually quite similar to packaging ordinary things uh, in Nix. So what you do typically in Nix is, uh, if you want to package something, you write a Nix expression. A Nix expression is typically a function declaration, and the parameters correspond to the dependencies of a service. And in the body, you basically describe how to build the package from the source code and the given dependencies. So in this particular example, I have a package called Hello World Client, which is just a simple client uh, connecting to a server through a TCP connection. And what I basically do here is I provide uh, the locations of the dependencies as make flags. And as a result, uh, the, build, uh, the build procedure knows how to find the dependencies and build the package. But in a microservice architecture, we typically rely on network connections. So for example, uh, the Hello World client uh, is supposed to connect to a, a, a something called a Hello World service by a TCP connection. And that Hello World server uh, uh, component may actually, be, may actually be deployed through a remote machine in the network. If this service is unavailable, that means the, net, the Hello World client doesn't work. So there's actually another class of dependencies we have to take into account. So in Disnix, we take two kinds of dependencies into account. One of them, uh, one class is called intra-dependencies. That means the dependencies you need uh, to build and run a, uh, a package locally. So things like compilers and libraries are, intra are considered intra-dependencies. And interdependencies are dependencies on other services that re might re uh, re uh, reside elsewhere in the network. So this is what, uh, what you typically do in this Nix. So uh, it almost looks like a, a normal Nix expression, but the inner function uh, that's colored in red is basically, uh, is basically a specification of the interdependencies that we need. And we can use this interdependency parameter, for example, to provide the host name and the TCP port of the Hello World server so that the client knows how to reach it. Like ordinary uh, Nix packages, uh, in Nix, 
each next expression is basically a function definition uh, in which the inputs are basically the, the dependencies that it needs, but these dependencies need to be composed, so they need to be passed as function arguments to the to the to the expression describing it. In this Nix, you also have to do have to do this. So what you typically find in, in Nix packages is some big expression called all packages.nix, in which we have a construct like call package that provides the dependencies. In this Nix, you also have to provide the internet dependencies for each uh, service that you want to distribute. But there's some extra information that it needs to know. So uh, as I so besides interdependencies, we also need to know stuff about interdependencies. And also, if we want to deploy uh, a system into production, besides getting a package somewhere, we also need to activate the system. And that's actually captured in this model, the services model. So as you can see in the slide, uh, the services model refers to the composition expression shown in the previous slide. But it provides some extra information uh, for each service, allowing it to find uh, its interdependencies and uh, uh, and also, uh, it, it provides information to allow it to be activated. And here, for example, the Hello World server. Uh, here I specify, for example, that it runs on port 3000. Um, I also provide a type, and that's actually used for activation. So the wrapper type basically means uh, the package includes a script uh, explaining how to start and stop uh, the service. And the Hello World client, uh, so the depends on uh, parameter, uh, basically composes the inter interdependency. So by passing this as a function argument to the, to the expression shown earlier, um, the Hello World client knows to which Hello World server component it should connect. Then of course, uh, besides the services, we also need to know uh, what machines are available and what their properties are. So this is an example infrastructure model. We have three kinds of machines. Um, the first machine is actually a 32-bit Kubuntu Linux machine, and you can uh, use an SSH connection to, uh, to reach it, to execute remote deployment procedures. The second machine is a 64-bit NixOS machine, and to reach it, uh, we actually use a web service instead of, HC, uh, instead of SSH. And the third machine is actually a 64-bit Windows 7 machine that we can reach uh, through SSH. And then, of course, the last model is the distribution model. And here, for example, I, I tell Disnix Hello World server should be deployed to machine test 2. That's the 64-bit NixOS machine. And the client should be deployed to uh, machine test 1. And that's the 32-bit uh, Kubuntu machine. So I can actually show you how this is done in practice. So I have VirtualBox box running with these three machines. There's also a Windows machine even. And if I just simply run this Nix on the command line with, uh, wait a sec. So this should suffice to get uh, this, the Hello World server and client deployed into the network of machines that I've shown to you. So this should take a few seconds. Um, there's actually one problem. I forgot to configure a, a public ho SSH host key on the Windows machine, so <laughs> I cheated by providing a very simple password for that machine. Oh. Something is wrong. Yeah, that's bad. Mm. Let me see something. Okay, this is always a risk. Uh. Hmm? No, I I discovered something else. Um, oh, the wrong example. I should have to use this terminal. I'm actually about. To, I was also planning to show a second demo, and this terminal screen was for the second demo. But this is the this is the right screen for the first demo. So if I run this. 
as you can see, it's trying to uh, to to, uh, to build the system. It's trying to distribute uh, the closures. Now it's asking me for a password, but I can just uh, cheat a bit. Okay, so uh, I basically run run this next env with the models I've shown you before, and that means. Uh, we should now have a, uh, a working system with a hello world service and a hello world client. So the 32-bit um, Kubuntu machine now has a hello world client uh, application uh, deployed. Actually, the example is pretty silly, but what it does is it's just a, a, a telnet connection, and if I say hello, the, the server responds by saying hello, hello world. But it's just to show I've, I've deployed two components and they interact with each other with a TCP connection and both are deployed to different machines. What I also can do is, for example, I can change the distribution model. So this is, uh, this is my initial deployment, but I can also say, hey, let's deploy a second client. So that means uh, the, also the 64-bit NixOS machine has a, a client installed. And then it's just basically repeating the same command line instruction. It figures out that we have to execute an upgrade. And voila, we're done. So if I connect to this machine, the second uh, NixOS machine, then I'll see there's also a Hello World client deployed. Voila. We can do even more exciting stuff. So there's a third machine in the network, a Windows 7 machine. So let's make use of it. I move the Hello World server that's currently running on test 2 to test 3, which is the Windows machine. And I try to redeploy the environment. So now you see I run into a problem. And the problem is actually uh, Disnix tries to compile uh, the Hello World service from source. On, the, on my host machine. But my host machine is a Linux machine, which is enabled to build for Windows. Uh, luckily, there's also an option built on targets, allowing me to do uh, the, the builds on the target machines in the network. And if I do something like this, I basically de delegate the builds to the target machines in the network. Well, this should only take a minute, but it's now building the uh, the Hello World server on the on the Windows machine. What happens to the Hello World server right now? Yeah, that's a good question. I'll show you. I'll show it to you in a minute. So, I redeploy the system. What happens to the Hello World server? That means it, I moved it, so it was deactivated uh, on machine test 2. So that means the clients have been disconnected. But if I would start the Hello World client again, then it has been reconfigured to connect to the Hello World server that has been deployed to the Windows machine. So it knows where it is. And I can do again hello and see. You see, it just simply responds by... Uh, No, so it works like the ordinary Nix package manager. Uh, it always keeps uh, the older versions available unless you explicitly garbage collect them. So that means I can also do a rollback, for example, uh, to the previous configuration. I now have to t to shut these. Uh, yeah, well, each time you deploy a new Disnix configuration, it uh, deploys a Disnix profile on the target machines, and if, as long as you keep these Disnix profiles there. That means the software also remains there. But you can, you can, of course, use the garbage collector to get rid of them. And then, as a result, the old versions will be removed. OK, now I have to do some housekeeping work. So I have to shut down the, the virtual machines. And um, I have to do something else. But in a minute, I'll, t I'll tell you what it's about. Because this takes a, a minute. And of course, uh, I don't have all the time to. Um, 
I'm now going to run Nixops for some reason, but uh, so. Oh, oops. Hmm. Okay. It seems that I doubly deployed the. Uh, well, let's get rid of it. So I create a, a Nixops deployment named VBox and that contains two VirtuBox machines. But in a minute I'll show you what this is about. Uh, this takes a while to deploy, so meanwhile I resume the presentation. So uh, I've basically shown you uh, what this is capable of. We can deploy uh, uh, services to any kinds of machine in the network. And this is actually the communication flow that Disney's env tool implements. So it uses some kind of external process that communicates with a protocol wrapper. And the reason why we implemented that is to support multiple network protocols. So by default, it uses SSH, but the second machine, the NixOS 64-bit machine, was actually uh, reachable through a web service only. So uh, this makes Disney's protocol agnostic, and that's particularly useful for service-oriented architectures that are supposed to be technology ne neutral. Also, um, the Disney service that's responsible for carrying out the remote uh, uh, deployment activities consults two tools basically to carry. Ah, that's my virtual machine. Oops. So it consults two, uh, two tools to carry out deployment activities. So for building and distributing uh, services, it uses a Nix package manager. But to get a service-oriented system running, you need to do more. You also need to activate uh, each service and deactivate the obsolete ones. And I implemented a separate tool for that. It's called Disnomia, and that's actually a companion tool. Uh, but you can also use that in, uh, independently. And that takes care, for example, of turning all the services on or off, if we must. And there's actually a plug-in system that supports many kinds of services. So, for example, you can model something as a, a MySQL database, and this Nomi has a plug-in that knows how to activate and deactivate a MySQL database. And you can basically uh, use this for any kind, of the, any kind of technology, as long as you just implement an, uh, an activation plug-in that has a standardized interface. Also, this Nix env itself uh, is composed of several command line utilities. So, for example, this Nix env first builds the configuration, then distributes the configuration, then activates it. They're all implemented by separate com command line utilities that you can also invoke yourself if you must. And also, for example, if we enable build delegation, that's what we did with the Windows machine, two additional uh, command line utilities are invoked that are responsible for doing that. So, back to our example system, the staff tracker that we've designed. Uh, I want to deploy this with Disnix. So, how can we do that? So, first, of course, I need to implement it. So, I just picked some technologies to implement these components. I use MongoDB for each database. I use Node.js for the web application and services. I provi provide a REST API for each data set. And I add an Nginx proxy in front of it. So I cheated a bit in my previous example. So I already had two machine, three machines available that I pre-deployed myself. But in order to completely perform a deployment process with system, we also need to create these machines first. And that's, for example, something Disnix doesn't support. Disnix expects machines to be present already, having certain kinds of characteristics. So I get. So some people ask me like, hey, Nixops and Disks are pretty similar to each other. Are they actually in competition with each other? But they actually serve different purposes. And this Nix Nixops can actually so solve this infrastructure de uh, deployment problem. It can provide me machines running Nix uh, OS, having certain ca characteristics. And I can use this Nix to deploy to these machines. So for example, this machine configuration is enough to get my example system running. I, for example, need MongoDB to be running and I need a Disnix service. And also, the Nixos module system is uh, uh, quite clever. So if I uh, enable MongoDB, uh, Disnix also gets configured to get the, the MongoDB plugin for Disnomia running so that I can activate MongoDB databases. 
Then there's an extension tool for Disnix called Disnix OS, and that's something you can use to basically integrate Nixops and uh, Disnix with each other. So from a user perspective, the major difference between Disnix and Disnix OS is, is the, the infrastructure model. The infrastructure model captures the available machines and their properties, but the Nixops specification sort of do, does the same thing. So th this NixOS allows you to use uh, a, a NixOps model instead of an infrastructure model, and then simply yeah, deploy to whatever we have deployed with NixOps. And that's actually what I intend to show now. So this is the reason why I deployed two NixOps machines. So they have been deployed successfully, but I can now, for example, use this Nix to deploy my Node.js processes in the databases. So with this environment variable, I can specify to which uh, Nixops deployment I want to refer. And by running this command line instruction, so here I provide the Nixops models as a parameter. And I also tell this NixOS to use Nixops. And by running this, I can get this nice staff tracker example deployed into production. This also should take less than a minute, but... Yeah, it's now evaluating the network configurations, uh, but that's quite uh, memory consuming. Okay, now it starts building the components, but I pre-built them already, so this should be pretty quick. Okay, now it's distributing the closures of uh, all the components. I think my machine is responding quite slowly because of these virtual machines. now apparently reading a lot of files. I can see the LED indicator of my hard drive uh, blinking. Ah, okay, now it's uploading uh, closures. And now it's activating all the service components like the databases and the node processes in the right order. So this order is derived from uh, all the interdependencies. And now it's done. I deployed the web application frontend to the first machine. Uh, I have to figure out what its IP address is. So this is the IP address of the first machine. So I can simply use my web browser now to open the stuff tracker web frontend. Okay, takes a while before Firefox gets started. Ah, so this is the web application. It doesn't look very exciting, but uh, it should work. So uh, there's one important uh, person from the Nix project missing. That was my former colleague, Rob Vermaas. So let's add him. As you can see, Rob Vermaas has been added. And actually, the insertion in the database is handled by a different microservice that actually resided on machine test two instead of test one. So we have a distributed application running now on two machines deployed by Nixops. Okay, so that was my second demo. So regarding these examples I've shown you, uh, they were kind of silly, right? So I've also been using uh, Nixops and Disnix in practice at my current employer, Conference Compass. So what Conference Compass basically does is they provide a service, and the most visible part of the service is actually their app. They provide apps for conference uh, organizers and attendees, and basically uh, the idea is that each uh, customer gets their own app with their own set of features, their own uh, style, their own artwork, and so on. Um, we have actually set up a, a Hydra-based product line to uh, accomplish that, but I'm not going to talk about uh, that in this uh, presentation. 
But also, uh, one of the features we have is we have a, a web application uh, that each customer can use to configure the app. So, for example, an app needs to display the conference program. And we have a web application allowing people to configure the conference program and dynamically uh, publish that as an update to the app. And also, uh, for some of our b uh, big customers, we connect to their information systems because they typically have some means to maintain and program themselves. And we integrate with that so, so that they don't have to manually provide the data. We made some architectural decisions. So each app requires a configurator. We've decided to deploy many instances of a conf configurator uh, instead of just having one big configurator that's responsible for handling all the traffic. That has all, has all kinds of advantages. For example, we have no single point of failure. If a configurator for one app crashes, then the other should still run. It's also more scalable in the sense that uh, if one configurator is slow, it shouldn't slow the others down. We can also be more flexible, like moving configurators from one machine to another. We can support multiple versions. So, for example, for an old app, we don't have to be afraid breaking the old app by changing the API of the REST interface. Uh, and we also used, uh, used several programming languages. So, for example, for the, the configurator, we use Node.js. But we also in implement programs that integrate uh, with each third-party service, and we implement it as a separate Python process. And all these components communicate with each other through uh, REST, AT, uh, REST APIs. So in practice, this means we deploy four kinds of services with Disnix. We deploy configurators, channels. We deploy Mongo databases that Basically, for each configurator instance, we have a separate database. And we deploy Nginx proxies. And we deploy one Nginx proxy per machine that's responsible for handling all the incoming traffic and doing uh, the caching. So this is a very simple deployment uh, scenario. So if we have one machine, the gray box denotes a machine. And each oval is a service. So we have one uh, Nginx proxy that redirects uh, uh, incoming requests to two possible configurators. We have one called CC Demo and one called KS. And each uh, configurator instance connects to its own private channel and uh, database. I actually used uh, a tool in the Disnix toolset called Disnix Visualize to generate this picture. We may run into a situation that we suddenly require a lot of network bandwidth. So for example, a Congress goes live, then if we have too many configurators on one machine, uh, we, we might not be able to handle all the traffic. So we want to move uh, a configurator instance to a second machine. And Disnix actually allows us to do that easily. We can just adapt the distribution model and put a second Nginx uh, service in front of it and we're done. And also we can do more advanced stuff. We can also even deploy m multiple redundant instances of the same configurator if we really have to handle a lot of uh, network load. And that's also done by simply changing the distribution model, and that's it. So, yeah, but... Um, so, we've been using uh, Disnix and NixOps for quite a while now, since January. And we've been managing, like, uh, between 6 and 11 Amazon EC2 instances. That really depends on how much system resources we need at the time. Uh, we've deployed over 80 configurators with Disnix. And if you would take all the interdependencies into account, that means we have more than 200 services managed by Disnix. Also, uh, we update the production environment quite a lot. So that means uh, sometimes we even update uh, like three times a day. I think some companies, especially enterprises, they're afraid uh, implementing upgrades once a month even. And we can do it three times a day. I think that's quite impressive. And also the transition phase duration is five minutes. So in the phase in which we deactivate old services and activate services, there is a bit of downtime. But uh, if we would reactivate the entire environment, it would take at most five minutes. I think that's also quite nice. So yeah, that's basically uh, my talk. So uh, what I've been trying to explain is there... <laughs> What I've been trying to explain is, yeah, the relevance of microservice architectures, or I would rather call them componentized architectures. I've explained how to do service deployment with Disnix. I've also, sh also shown that you can integrate that with NixOps to do infrastructure deployment. And I've shown a real-life usage scenario. 
So yeah, if you want to know more, there's the Disney homepage, of course. Uh, the examples I've used in this presentation, they're also available online. There's one thing uh, I have to remind uh, every one of you, it's still an advanced prototype tool, Disney, so some things might not be perfect. And also in terms of uh, usability, definitely some things can be improved, but I'm working on that. And of course, there's also my PhD dissertation, so if you really want to know everything, you should read this. Okay, that's it. Okay, we have time only for one or two questions, but I think Sandra will still be around, right? So it's not the last opportunity to ask. Um, how do you deal with state? Uh, um, as uh, you know, um, you, you talk about things migrating between machines yeah. easily. Um, what if it has something in slash var, or what if yeah. there's an upgrade to be done, or stuff like that? Yeah, yeah, that's actually a very good question. I left these details out of the presentation because otherwise it would, would become much too long. But recently, I uh, I implement uh, an extension to Dysnomia, the tool that implements the activation and deactivation operations, also to have snapshot and restore operations. Uh, by default, it's disabled because it's still quite experimental, but uh, you can also enable, uh, enable it by annotating the services in the services model, like, hey, this has state, please migrate it for me. And what it does is, is basically it consults the snapshot operation of Dysnomia, uh, transfers the snapshot to the, to the host machine, and then uh, after the upgrade has been done, it transfers it uh, to the new machines and restores the snapshots accordingly. So there's a, there's a pluggable snapshot and restore framework uh, that can be used for that. But it's not always the best solution, by the way, to use it. Because, uh, for example, if you would uh, move a MySQL database to one machine or another, it calls MySQL dump. And for MongoDB, it calls Mongo dump. But uh, serializing a database into a portable format and back again is quite an expensive operation. So uh, using replication engines, for example, for big data sets, would be much more uh, a much better fit for the but for the small data sets it's actually fine so at my current employer we have databases that are like 20 or 30 megabytes in size and you could easily move them around with uh, mongo dump and mongo restore and that's actually what we've been using to uh, to move data around and that actually works quite well for us hi uh, i wanted to know how does this system, from a distributed system's point of view, how does your coordinator handle partial failure um, and reconciliation in the face of partial failure? You mean if any of the activities fail while deploying a system? What happens? Yeah, transient network failures, machines die. Um, yeah. Like what what kind of resiliency does this system have to this production environment? Um, yeah. So um, this next. If you deploy a system with Disney, it's actually I can show you the slide. So if I would decompose Disney's env, these tools are executed. The first two tools on top, the first one builds the configuration. It produces some kind of low-level specification called a manifest. Uh, that's always safe to execute because it uses uh, Nix as the underlying infrastructure to build it. And you, if, a, for example, a build fails in the middle, it's considered garbage. Uh, by, by Nix and it gets removed uh, if you r run the garbage collector for instance. So that's always a safe operation. Same thing for distribute, so if uh, copying a closure interrupts in the middle, that means you have a set of valid packages and then a set of invalid packages. The set of val valid packages always has, uh, uh, never has any broken relationship, uh, dependency relationships for example, so that's also safe. But the other activities like activating and uh, uh, setting the profiles, that's actually unsafe. So um, one of the things I, for example, do is I lock uh, uh, the Disney service instances on the target machine so that others cannot interfere with it. But if for some reason uh, the network connection fails, uh, then the host machine still knows, hey, I'm not done yet because I don't have... Uh, I don't have configured this, uh, the Disney's profiles on the machines yet, so that means I probably have to redo the whole uh, act activation procedure uh, from scratch. Um, but still, it's uh, 
there are still some improvements possible because it could also happen that a machine disappears while deploying, but it never comes back again. And that means, yeah, you have to change the distribution model probably to... Uh, yeah, as a, as a follow-up, so would you consider Disnix like a deployment tool or, or a cluster manager? Like um, Disnix itself is a deployment tool. And right. that, that and the reason why I consider it to be a deployment tool is that the specifications, the services model, the infrastructure model, and distribution model, they're only used for carrying out the corresponding uh, deployment activities. Uh, you might also want to think about other aspects while deploying a system. For example, um, in the distribution model, you have to be quite explicit about the mapping. So you have to really say, I want this service to be deployed to machine test two. But if you have a uh, an environment with like 1,000 machines, that's too tedious probably. So you want to have something that says, figure out a, a machine with enough system resources that can run it. Yeah. yeah. Actually, Disnix doesn't support that directly, but I also implemented, while I was doing research on my PhD thesis, an extension framework called Dynamic Disnix. And there you can use deployment planning algorithms to calculate distributions, for example. And also you can uh, retrieve machines conf machine configuration settings by a discovery service. So there's less for you to write. But that's still experimental. It's actually still on my list to make it more mature, but I'm still working on that. But the core tool set that actually carries out the, the activities, the, so the basic Disnix tool set, that should be mature enough. But this extension tool set, that's, yeah, the only reference you've to, you, at the moment is my research paper or my uh, PhD thesis, if you want to know more. All right, we've run out of time, unfortunately. <laughs> so um, thank you very okay. much.